Amen. Thank you, Brother Wayne. I love that song. Ye who are weary, come home. If you're weary, you need rest. Come to Jesus this morning. Amen. Amen. Be turning to 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. 2 Corinthians chapter number 3 is where we are going to be at eventually this morning. And um, I appreciate um, you coming this morning. Hope you came um, ready to receive from the Lord. And um, we are here to um, focus on Him. We're here to receive something from Him, but also to give something back to Him. And so I hope you came with that spirit this morning um, to receive from Him, but also to give back to Him in worship. And um, 2 Corinthians 3 is where we're going to be at this morning. But um, before we get there, um, we are continuing our series, Free in 23, that we started last week, where we are seeing what it means to be truly set free by Jesus. Um, I'm glad there is freedom in Christ, Um, freedom from sin, freedom to live, freedom to worship, freedom um, to be the people that God has called us to be. In him, and we've adopted a theme verse of John 8 36. So I want us to say that together. It will be up on the screen. Um, John 8 36 tells us, If the Son therefore shall set you free, ye shall be free indeed. Let's read that one more time together. If the Son therefore shall set you free, ye shall be free indeed. How many of you want to be free indeed? Free indeed as the people of God um, to be who he has called us to be. And with that in mind, we come to 2 Corinthians chapter number 3. Beginning at verse 12, the Apostle Paul is writing. He says, Seeing then that we have such hope, we use great plainness of speech. Not as Moses, which put a veil over his face, that the children of Israel could not steadfastly look to the end of that which is abolished. But their minds were blinded, for until this day remaineth the same veil untaken away in the reading of the Old Testament, which veil is done away in Christ. But even unto this day, when Moses is read, the veil is upon their heart. Nevertheless, when it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. Now the Lord is that Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. But we all, with open face, beholding as in a glass or as in a mirror, the glory of the Lord, are changed into the same image from glory to glory, even as by the Spirit of of the Lord. Lord Jesus, give us wis- give us wisdom and understanding with what you want to say to us this morning. Give us ears to hear, ha- eyes to see, and hearts to receive all that you want to say to us this morning. Fill me with your spirit. Help me preach exactly what you'd have me to. Nothing more, nothing less. And we give you the glory for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, we saw that true freedom comes from knowing Christ, knowing who we are in Christ as the body of Christ and the bride of Christ, and then knowing what we have in Christ. And we talked about how we have freedom from sin and fullness, the fullness of God, because we are in Christ. Now today we see that true freedom comes from leaving legalism and walking in the Spirit. If we're honest... Many more of us, even in the church today, are operating still under legalism instead of the Spirit. We're operating according to the list of rules that we've grown up with, or the traditions of man, just as the Pharisees were in Jesus' time, instead of walking in the Spirit. Because the Bible says here that where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. So with this in mind, we see that true freedom comes, first of all, from leaving legalism. We must leave legalism if we're going to be free in Jesus. Let me say that again. We must leave legalism if we are going to be free in Jesus. So the question is, what is legalism? And simply put, legalism 
is keeping a list of rules for righteousness or being made right with God. In other words, we think that being right with God is all about keeping rules and regulations. Do this, don't do that. So it's about keeping a list of rules for righteousness, but it's also about worshiping and serving based on the traditions of man, just as the religious leaders were in Jesus' time. Wouldn't it be awful for your Messiah, the one that you had written about, the one you had hoped for, the one that that you supposedly were expecting and that was promised throughout all the Old Testament scriptures, shows up on the scene and you completely miss him because of your traditions? Let me suggest that happens all the time. Even in this age of grace where Jesus shows up, the Holy Spirit wants to start moving, but we quench the Spirit all because of the traditions of man. Ultimately, we become a servant of the law and traditions instead of Christ. I'm reminded of what Jesus said in Matthew 16, verse 6, where he warns his disciples, he said, Take heed and beware of the leaven of the Pharisees and of the Sadducees. Beware of the leaven of the Pharisees, because if we're not careful, we'll all start operating with a Pharisee spirit. We'll operate, we'll think that we're right with God because we're keeping all the right rules, and they're obviously not right with God because they're not keeping the same rules as us. Or we'll say, well, we know that this is the right way to worship, this is the right way to serve because this is what I grew up with. When in reality, we've never consulted the Word of God. We've never consulted what it is that God's Word says. It doesn't matter what we think. It doesn't matter what what our ancestors thought. All that matters is what God's Word says. And if we can agree on that this morning, then we can get somewhere. If we can agree that it doesn't matter what we've been taught, what matters is what God's Word says. Legalism is all about the traditions of man, all about doing things based on what we've known and what we've believed instead of what God says. And so if we're going to be truly free, we got to leave behind legalism. Why? Paul, Paul is, is writing here, and he's writing about those who say they want to come to Christ, but they're going back to the law of Moses. And and he says, ultimately, the law is supposed to bring us to the glory. After Moses had gone to the mountain, his face shone bright as the noonday sun because he had been in the glory of God. But he has to put this veil over his face because the people that hadn't been in the that hadn't been to the mountain with God, they couldn't look on the glory of God. And Paul uses that as an analogy. He says, Israel, for the most part, the, the, the law should have brought them to the glory of God as embodied in Jesus Christ because the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld His glory. But he said instead, they can't look on the glory because the law has blinded their eyes, it's put a veil over their face and ultimately a veil over their heart. Legalism always puts up a veil. Legalism always puts up a veil that keeps us from going on with Jesus. Legalism puts a veil over our heads. He put it on his face. What do you mean by that? We start to think that somehow salvation is by our works. It is not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. It is by grace we are saved through faith. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any one of us should boast. But many people think, well, I got to do this, and I got to do that to be saved. I I got to get dunked in water to be saved. I've got to to live up to it if I'm really going to stay saved. And ultimately, salvation becomes about their works. Salvation is not about our works. It's about the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, and thank God it is. Because if it's about our works and what we do or don't do, every one of us are going to go to hell. 
But thank God, in his mercy, he sent one who could keep the law. He sent one who did keep the law, his only son, Jesus. He went to a cross as a sinless sacrifice, shedding his blood to cover our sins. And now we are saved simply by the grace of God through faith in Jesus Christ. Our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Legalism puts a veil over our heads to think that salvation is by our works. And then we start to think that we can make ourselves right with God. We can somehow in our flesh make ourselves right with God. And ultimately we forget or ignore how sinful we really are. We get filled with pride. Well, I'm doing this. And they're not doing that. I, I, I'm living this way. And they're not living that way. And we get filled with pride. And pride is just as much a sin. Just as much a stench in the nostrils of a holy God. That, than any sin you can think of. Because pride keeps us from Jesus. Pride is why Lucifer got kicked out of heaven and became the devil by the way. You're never more like the devil than when you're proud. And you're never more like Jesus than when you're humble. God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. But when we're operating under legalism, it leads to pride. We forget and ignore how sinful we really are, and ultimately we fall away from the grace of God. What does that mean? It means that we are not relying on grace alone if we're relying on grace plus works. It is grace plus nothing and minus nothing that we are saved, that we are right with God, that we stay saved, and that we're going to heaven. We are preserved in Christ Jesus. We are bought with a price, not our own. We're on our way to heaven, not because of what we do, but because of what Jesus did. Plain and simple. But when we're relying on our works, either to get saved or to stay right with God, ultimately we are falling away from the grace of God and I found that many in that condition quit showing grace to others. Many who, who are bound by legalism, bound by rules and regulations, not only have they fallen away from the grace of God in that they're not relying solely on that to be right with God, but they also quit showing grace to other people. Always looking with down their noses, at somebody else, and normally they pick out somebody that they know is doing something they're not doing and have no grace at all in their, how can we expect God to show us grace if we're not showing others grace? And we quit showing grace. Legalism puts a veil over our head, but it also puts a veil over our heart. That's what Paul said about Israel. He said that the law... This legalistic, this legalistic veil, as pictured by the veil that Moses put over his face, he said, ultimately, now that veil is over their heart to where they can't receive from God in his grace because this veil is over their heart. When the veil of legalism is over our heart, we start comparing ourselves to others. 2 Corinthians 10 verse 12. For we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves. And that's talking about the 12 original apostles. He said, we dare not make ourselves of the number or compare ourselves with some that commend themselves. But they measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. You are not wise if you're comparing yourself to somebody else. Because what do we do? We pick out somebody we know is worse than us. Or that we think is worse than us. We're like that Pharisee Jesus talked about who prays within himself, God, I thank you I'm not like this publican over here. I thank you that I'm not like these sinners. I thank you that I'm not doing that. And you can fill in the blank with whatever that is in your mind. 
and we are puffed up with pride, comparing ourselves among ourselves. And he says, when we do that, we're not wise. Because ultimately, on the day of judgment, what we're going to be compared with is the standard of Christ. That he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. And every one of us falls short of the glory of God when it comes to sin. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. But legalism puts a veil on our heart where we start comparing ourselves with, other, with others and we pick out people that we think we're closer to God than so we can compare ourselves to them. Sometimes we compare ourselves with other Christians. Like the preacher I heard about, he was the moderator at the Baptist business meeting. He got up and he, he was given the annual report. And he said, he said, well, baptisms are down this year. Giving's down this year. Um, church attendance is down this year. And, and the whole crowd was getting sad. And then he said, but thank God the Methodists aren't doing any better. <laughs> when we compare ourselves among ourselves, we're not wise. When we compare ourselves to Jesus, we realize how desperate we are for the grace of God. How we can't save ourselves, we can't make ourselves right with God. We need the grace of God. We need God to do it through us and for us or it won't get done. But when the veil is over our heart, we compare ourselves to others. Then we start competing with one another. We'll compare ourselves with one another, then we'll compete with one another. I'm reminded of when Jesus is on the road, and James and John's mother comes up to him and says, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, let my boys sit one on your right hand and one on the left. In other words, give them the position of power. Give them the position of prominence in your kingdom. And we're no better today. In the church, we still compete over positions and titles. Why, why do we need titles anyway? Why can't we just be Christians? Amen. But yet, from the beginning, we have competed over positions because we have this veil on our heart. We compete with other denominations. Another time, some of his disciples came to him and he said, there's some people over there healing in your name, but they're not part of our group. Do you want us to go tell them to stop? And Jesus said, no, don't go tell them to stop. If they're doing it in my name, they're doing a good work. And yet we, in our arrogance, sometimes... And I'll only preach about us Baptists, because that's what I am, contrary to popular belief. But we Baptists oftentimes say, well, they're not part of us, so they can't be right with God. They, they, they don't really follow the Bible because we're the only group following the Bible. We can't learn anything from them because they're not part of our group. And if God is going to do anything in the world, he's going to do it through Southern Baptists. That's what we think. And I'm here to tell you that is contrary to the word of God. But when we're operating by the traditions of man and not the word of God, then we're going to compare ourselves with other people and start competing with them. Why? Because we got to prove that we're right and they're wrong. Preachers are notorious for this. Let's get on Facebook and talk about the preacher down the road, how he's a heretic because he don't agree with me on every minute point. Competing. What does 1 Corinthians 1, 12? Paul is warning them, and he, he, he says this as an indictment to them. He says, now this I say, every one of you saith, I am of Paul, I am of Apollos, and I am of Cephas, that's Peter. And some wanted to do, outdo all of them, so they said, well, we're of Christ. I am of Paul. 
I'm of Apollos, I am of Peter, well, I'm of Christ. And the church had gotten divided over who was with who. And Paul came along and he said, no, they're all being used. He said, I planted, Apollos watered, but God gave the increase. And God is using people who follow him in all denominations, in all parts of the world, to plant the seed of the gospel in the hearts of men, women, boys, and girls, that somebody else will come along and water, and God ultimately going to give the increase. Let me remind you, we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. Our enemy is not another denomination. Our enemy is not someone in a different political party. Our enemy is not flesh and blood, but principalities and powers. Our enemy is the spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places that are constantly trying to get us to forsake the mission that Jesus has given us to take the gospel into all the world. And if he can get us bogged down, worried about other Christians and what they're doing or not doing, he succeeded because when we're worried about that, we're not worried that there's lost people all around us who if they die today, they're not going to make it to heaven. They're going to go to hell. And the only hope they have is if someone that's on their way to heaven can get to them and tell them the truth of the gospel. We, I like what Lester Summerall, now he's not a Baptist, so don't shoot me. He said one time, great assembly of God preacher, he said, if I find out someone has drawn a circle and left me out of it, I'm going to draw a bigger one and keep them in it. Why? Because it is through unity of the, of the body of Christ that an unbelieving world is going to come to Jesus. They were all with one accord in one place when the Holy Spirit fell. If we want the Spirit of God to fall and work through us and use us in a powerful way and truly be free in Him, we got to get over all this other stuff that, that, that put a veil over our heart. We should learn from one another and not argue with one another. Amen right there. I had a conversation this week with my dad. Many of you know over the last year or so, he's had a really hard time. He hadn't preached in over a year. He told me the other day, he's been going to a counselor to deal with his grief, and the counselor's an assembly of God. And he said, I'm going to preach on my birthday. And he said... And it's going to be in his church. Y'all would have to know my dad to know what a miracle that is anyway. But anyway. But we were talking, having this conversation. I said, if Peter and Paul could learn from one another, as opposite as they were, then surely Baptists can learn from assemblies of God and vice versa. In other words, if you're a believer in Christ, you have something to say that I need to hear, and vice versa. And we should all be learning from one another and working together to get the gospel to the nations before the end comes. Amen. But when the veil's over our heart, we're competing with one another. And we fail to truly love others as we are commanded in Scripture and ultimately, we fail to see God because Israel missed God incarnate, Jesus Christ, come in the flesh. Even to this day, he said, when Moses is read, the veil is on their heart. I'm glad, though, verse 16 is in there. Nevertheless... When it shall turn to the Lord, the veil shall be taken away. And then he goes on to clarify that the Lord is that spirit, and where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty. Nevertheless, even if we've been operating with a veil over our head or over our heart, when we truly turn to the Lord and see him, 
the Spirit of God will fill us and use us and work through us and bring us to a place of liberty because legalism puts us in bondage, but, li- but the Spirit gives us life in Christ Jesus. Same thing Paul said in Romans 8, 1 and 2. There is therefore now no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the Spirit. For the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus hath made me free from the law of sin and death. When we truly look to the Lord... Quit looking around at everybody we've been competing with and comparing ourselves to. And we look to the Lord and we rely on Him. He will fill us with the Spirit and we will have true freedom and true liberty. Freedom to live, freedom to serve, and freedom to worship. The hour is coming, Jesus said, when true worshipers will worship me in spirit And in truth, we must not just forsake and leave legalism, but we got to live under the control of the Holy Spirit. Live under the control, that's what it means to walk in the Spirit. It means that every day that I live, I'm going to the cross to be crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I'm going to live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. And Christ is in me, the hope of glory, through the Holy Spirit. And so I'm going to walk under his control. I'm going to live under the direction and control of the Holy Spirit. I'm going to walk that way and I'm going to worship that way. If I'm going to worship Him in spirit and in truth, my worship is going to be directed by the Holy Spirit. Uh, Let me ask a few questions. And then I'll give you some possible suggestions as to their answers. You don't need to answer this out loud. But what would our service look like I don't mean our services on Sunday morning. I mean our service to others. In our service to Christ, what would it look like if it was truly under the control of the Holy Spirit? I dare say that some would be doing more and others would be doing less. What, I, I didn't think you could do enough for Jesus. That's true generically. But in reality, a lot of times we do things... Because it's a good idea when the Holy Spirit of God hadn't told us to do it. Even if it's something good, if the Holy Spirit of God has not told you to do it, you don't need to do it. Some churches have to have this program because the church up the road has it. Or the denomination told me I needed to do this. When the Spirit of God has not told that church to do it. Our service would look radically different if it was truly under the control of the Holy Spirit. What would our thought life be like if it was truly being controlled by the Spirit? I dare say it would look more like the fruit of the Spirit instead of the works of the flesh. Love, joy, peace patience, gentleness, goodness, meekness, temperance, and faith would be filling our thoughts instead of thoughts of anger and malice and deceit if it was truly under control of the Holy Spirit. What would our prayer life look like if it was truly being controlled by the Holy Spirit? We might start praying differently for some than how we've been praying for them. I dare say we would, because we don't know how to pray, but the Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. What might our worship look like if it was under the control of the Holy Spirit? Not just based on tradition. Not just based on what we like. When when did we ever get the idea that worship is about what I like? Worship is not about what I like, it's about what God likes. 
And we need to be asking the question, what does God want? Instead of what do I want? Because when we're living, uh, when we're walking and worshiping, living under the control of the Holy Spirit, that's where true freedom is. We're no longer bound by tradition, no longer bound by rules and regulations of man, but we are free to live right and live right for the right reason. Not just to get a pat on the back from somebody else or to to look good to others in the community, but we're doing the right thing because we want to please Jesus and we love Him with all our heart, soul, mind, and strength. We're not just out telling people about Jesus to make a name for ourselves, but no, we are are telling people about Him because we love our neighbor as we love ourselves and we want them to go to heaven and not to hell. We're free to serve Christ and others just because we love Him. We think right, we act right, we love right, we serve right, and we shine bright when it's under the control of the Holy Spirit. We're free to pray in faith knowing we have received when it's under the control of the Holy Spirit. Because we know if we abide in Him and His Word abides in us, we can ask the Father whatever we will in His name and it will be done. Why do we know it's going to be done? Because it wasn't directed by me. I'm not praying, Lord, give me this because it's about me and what I want. No, I'm relying on the Holy Spirit of God to bring to my mind and to my heart what I need to pray for and who I need to pray for and how I need to pray for them. So I know when that happens, I know I've touched heaven. As the old timers used to put it, I know I've prayed through and the answer's on the way. Because it's under the control of the Holy Spirit. And then we are truly free to worship Him in spirit and in truth. Not only has the veil been lifted from our hearts and our heads when we turn to Christ, but I'm here to tell you the veil in the temple has been rent from the top to the bottom. And now anyone, regardless of your position in life, regardless of whether you're an Old Testament priest or not, anybody, Jew and Gentile, can now come into the Holy of Holies and we can have fellowship and audience with the God of the universe. We can enter in to His very presence. Why? Because Jesus went to a cross. The veil has been torn. He got up from the grave. The Spirit came down at Pentecost and He lives in us. Free to worship. Yet too many of us, we're still trying to put the new wine of the Holy Spirit into old bottles or old wineskins. Jesus warned of this in Mark 2.22. He was talking about how they couldn't accept Him as Messiah and they couldn't accept the outpouring of the Spirit that was coming because they're trying to force it into their legalistic tradition of Judaism. And He said, No man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine doth burst the bottles, and the wine is spilled, and the bottles will be marred. But new wine must be put into new bottles. It's kind of what Isaiah was saying and prophesying of in Isaiah 43, 19, where the Lord says, Behold, I will do a new thing. Now it shall spring forth, shall ye not know it? I will even make a way in the wilderness and rivers in the desert. God wants to pour out the river of living water, the Holy Spirit in fullness upon all His people. His Spirit in the last days is being poured out on all flesh according to Scripture. Yet so many of us, we only want the Spirit to be poured out if we can control it. We only want the Spirit of God to truly come in power if He comes in a way and in a tradition that we're comfortable with. And Jesus said that's not possible. Sometimes we can't We can't see God do a new thing in our midst because we want the new thing to be the old thing. Thought it might get quiet on this point this morning. What if our worship was under the control of the Holy Spirit? We might sing some old songs with a new anointing. 
to where they actually mean something. Instead of just singing them because we've always sung them. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found, was blind, but now I see. Oh, victory in Jesus, my Savior forever. He sought me and bought me with his redeeming blood. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. We might sing some of those old songs in a new way. Singing them with joy in our heart and excitement instead of just singing them because we've always sung them to where the words really jump off the page and into our hearts and we're singing from a heart that is anointed by the Holy Spirit of God. We might rediscover some of the old songs we forgot about. Songs like, Give me oil in my lamp, keep it burning. Or, do, Lord, oh, do, Lord, oh, do remember me. I got a home in glory land that outshines the sun. We might even start singing, and it really be true, and us not just sing it. He set me free, oh, he set me free. Glory to God, he set me free. Wouldn't it be awesome if some Baptists got set free this morning? Wouldn't it be awesome if we quit being bound by our tradition and stuck up because of who we are and just said, hey, I don't deserve none of this, but I'm giving Jesus my highest praise. I'm going to sing these old songs with a new, fresh anointing of the Holy Spirit of God. Hallelujah. I'm going to lose some of you on this next one, though. We might start singing some new songs with the old anointing. That former glory that filled the former house. We might start singing some new songs. Songs like, I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to break. Declaring there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. Because your name is power. Your name is healing. Your name is life. Break every stronghold. Shine through the shadows. Burn like a fire. We might start singing some new songs with the old anointing. And some old songs with a new anointing. And why do you say Because the Bible tells us, admonish yourselves with psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs. It seems to me that God likes variety. And so maybe if it becomes about what God likes instead of about what I like, we might really worship Him in spirit and truth. We might really worship Him in the anointing of the Holy Spirit because, friends, we got a generation that's grown up in our churches outside of the anointing of the Spirit. They've never seen the Spirit move in power. And if we don't show them what it's like and we don't get them into the presence of God when we get here, then why on earth are we here? Why on earth are we here if... Jesus said, where two or three are gathered in my name, I'll be in the midst. Why would we get them here if we're not trying to get them into the presence of God? Worship controlled by the Holy Spirit. Worshiping Him in spirit and in truth. You really want to be set free this morning? You got to leave legalism. Forget about it. Leave it all behind, a songwriter put it. We got to leave legalism. And then we got to say, Jesus, I want to live under the control of the Spirit. I want to walk in the Spirit because when I walk in the Spirit, I won't fulfill the lust of my flesh. 
I want to walk in the Spirit as a child of God who's been set free. And then I want to truly worship you in spirit and in truth under the direction of the Holy Spirit. I want to do whatever you tell me to do. I want to worship you in a way that is pleasing and honoring to you because you are the only one worthy. Worship is not about me. It is about you who are seated high on the throne of the universe. Who Heaven is your throne and earth is your footstool. Worship is not about me and my wants and my wishes, but it's about Jesus Christ. I ask you, are you living under legalism? Are you living free in the Spirit? Are you serving, living, praying, and worshiping under the control of the Spirit or the traditions of men? Every one of us got a choice to make. God has given us free will. He's not going to force himself on any one of us. But we got a choice to make. Am I going to stay over here in legalism where it's comfortable? Or am I going to walk out here into the wild unknown with the Holy Spirit of God, knowing that he's going to take me places for his glory, for the glory of God. He's going to take me to people for the glory of God that I can be a witness to. And he's going to take me into new levels and new heights in the glory of God. Why? Because each and every day that we get in the glory, more of the glory gets in us and on us. And he said, it's like looking in a, in a, in a looking glass or a mirror and I can begin to see the glory of God until one day I'm face to face with Jesus and it's all going to be glory it's not just going to be glimpses of glory like I get down here but it's going to be glory everywhere and for all time in the presence of the glorious one who went to a cross and got up from a grave and is ascended on high and coming back for us hallelujah Are you serving, praying, and worshiping under the spirit of the traditions of men? Choose to be free today and free indeed. When you're free, it don't matter who might talk about you because somebody's going to think you're weird if you're really worshiping under the Holy Spirit of God. Don't matter what people say. matters what God Almighty says. I want to worship him in spirit and in truth. Everyone bow your head and close your eyes.